Praise God. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We worship you today. We are starting a new series on the book of Colossians. I want to I want to ask you for a favor. Here's the favor. Allow me to teach you how to read the word of God. I love to teach and God is teaching me the word of God and our church is here to help you learn how to read the word of God. That's all I want to do is teach you how to read the word of God so that the word of God is exciting to you. So that the word of God is pleasing to you. Um, our church is, we are a teaching church and I'm always going to say it and I say it all the time to just remind you that that's what we're called to do. Amen. Today we're going to start, we did the book of Philippians, we learned. We're going to start the book of Colossians. It's four chapters. So essentially what we're doing is on Sundays, we're doing a Bible study. The word of God should excite you just simply being read. You don't need the hooting and the hollering and people falling on the floor for you to get excited. Because emotionalism does nothing for you. Emotion, I'm not saying don't get excited where you hoot and holler on the floor. As long as you understand what you're hooting and hollering about. Okay? allow the word of God to transform your mind today we're going to begin a four-week study on the book of Colossians this is a book that is about the exaltation of Christ meaning how Christ is magnified now when I tell you to to let me teach you the word of God that does not mean that you believe everything that I say that means you listen to what I'm saying and then you go and you verify it yourself right so like Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. If you don't know who Ronald Reagan is, uh, he's one of the greatest presidents to ever um, preside over the United States of America. We're going to start Colossians 1. We're going to talk about heresy. Heresy is a belief that undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ. A heresy is a false teaching. You must understand that if heresy is in scripture, heresy is still happening today. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, one author. That author wrote the Bible through people. Just like God uses you to speak to people, God used these people to speak to us. So if the one source is the Holy Spirit, then there can be no confusion at this level. Does that make sense? So that's how you have to read the word of God. So if God says something over here, he's not going to say something different over here. God is not going to tell your wife to go left and then tell the husband to go right because that's confusion. Now you would say, man, that sounds so simple. It does until you start getting down to the truth. What I've been noticing is in the error that we have is, is everybody wants to know the truth and then you get down to the truth and then you don't want to accept that that's the truth. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. It must be different because that's not what I thought was what it was going to say. The same way that I read that screenshot that... I thought it said, what up, Brian, is the same way that we misinterpret the word of God, that we want it to say something, so we read it looking to say it instead of reading it exactly for what it said. It said, what's up, Brian? Amen? Amen. Do not go into the word of God wanting to look for what you want. The way that you read the word of God is you go into the word of God looking for what it says so that it transforms your mind. Right? That's like... Somebody talk, Somebody says, oh, you know, uh, Brother Rob, right? Yeah, if you hang out with him a little in a little while, you'll see X, Y, Z. So guess what happens when I see Brother Rob? I'm already like, right? So I already have a preconceived notion to what my relationship is going to be with him based on what somebody said. So now I don't have a true understanding of who he is. That's how we read the word of God. The Holy Spirit wrote this letter through the Apostle Paul to deal with doctrinal heresy that was creeping into the Colossian church. There is no record of Paul visiting this church. He wrote this church, guess from where? From a prison. It's important to know the background of the things that you're reading because it brings everything, it, it brings it to life. It brings the word of God to life and understanding. So I want to talk to you about 
what's happening in the church of Colossae. Gnosticism, G-N-O. Gnosticism is a Greek word that means gnosis, right? Like I know something, gnosis. The idea is that people can only find their salvation and overcome the material world by attaining secret knowledge. So Gnostics, they believe that they're saved by their own methodology. Gnostics believe that um, this cup, if I worship this cup, that this cup can save me because I believe in that. That's what Gnosticism means. Does that make sense? Gnosticism is um, obviously heretical because there's no proof that that's true because somebody else can say, well, I believe this phone can save me. I'm exaggerating to make a point so that you can understand. Gnosis has no standard of measurement. The word of God is the standard. So we should all be having one mind like the Holy Spirit when you read the word of God. They shouldn't be the Pentecostals doing this and the Christians doing this and the Baptists doing this and the Seventh-day Adventists doing this. God is not the, the Holy Spirit didn't create all of those religions. Man created those religions. Right? So what is religion? This is what religion is. If you want to be part of the kingdom, you do what the king says. That's a relationship. If you want to be part of this church, you're not going to take your chair and sit it up here just because you want to. Because there's rules in this house. It's like, I don't go to your house. If you tell me, yo, mi casa, tu casa, do whatever you want. I don't go into your bedroom, kick my feet up, and turn on the TV. Nor do you have to tell me that. Why? Because it's known. There's some things that are just known that you don't do. And that's how the Bible was written. Because there's a standard. So we see that Gnostics, they believe in self-glorification. They believe that they are God. They believe that salvation is individual. That's what this letter was written to the church of Colossae. Paul never went there, but he's in jail and he writes this letter. Now we have mysticism, M-Y-S. Mysticism is similar to Gnosticism. Yet mysticism, see Gnosticism believes that there is a God a type of creator mysticism is when there is a spiritual realm with no god which is the occult that's what the occult is that there's a spiritual realm and now because there's no god you kind of just there's angels and, and demons or whatever it is that they call it and they're just like people passing by there's also syncretism syncretism and i'll get the team ready with the images up on the screen um, you can choose any of the three as long as we go through all three, please. Syncretism is the combination of different forms of belief and practices. So some people, and I know many of them in the city of Lawrence, they say, well, I like the Quran because it says this, and then I like the Holy Scriptures, which says this, and then I use them to make my own religion. That's demonic. Anything that's outside of this word of God, that's religion. Okay? Religion is when you don't do what the king says. So if the king says, do not eat pork, and I just use pork because it's so relatable and because it bothers our flesh. If, if the king said, not if, the king says don't eat pork. So if you decide to say that you can, that's religion. That's what Jesus came to break. Jesus came to break religion. Jesus didn't come to start Christianity. Jesus didn't come to, to do anything but to break the religious beliefs. Religious belief, you know what's religion? Christmas. Because it's not in the word. You know what's religion? Easter. If Jesus walked up on December 25th and you were like, Happy birthday, Jesus! He'd be like, Me? That's religion. Religion is when you don't do what God says. God says you shall not commit adultery. So if you struggle with fornication and you say that, that God says he's okay with that, that's religion. Does that make sense? So here's what syncretism is. Syncretism is the combination of the different forms of belief. We can get start with the images. The apostles suffered for Christ. This is what syncretism is. Now, when you read in the Bible, the images are a little distorted. It's just... Um, maybe I could crop it better or whatever. Syncretism means that you suffer for, for spiritual growth. 
Syncretism, this is what's happening in the church of Colossae. This is what this letter was written for. So when the Bible, when, when the apostle Paul says, and, the, and all the apostles say that they suffer for Christ, it's not this. This is a self-mutilation because you believe if I suffer in the flesh that it's supposed to bring you to a higher Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Does that make sense? We can go to the other image. I just want to give you the same image three different ways. This is a statue. You can get on a plane and you can find where the statue is and you can see it. There are people that believe this and in the church of Colossae, this was the issue. So... I'll get that in, into that in a second. But the book of Ephesians, for example, it wasn't written because there was a problem in that Ephesus. The book of Ephesians was written for something else. Some letters are written because there's a problem and they went to Paul and they say, yo, these people, there's false doctrines that are creeping in into what we already started. So this is syncretism. This is where if you look in the front at the bottom of the screen, there's an offering bowl there. So when we do offerings here in the church, where does that come from? That comes from scripture. Because the devil, we rebuke him in the name and blood of Jesus. What he likes to do is he likes to mimic what God does, but it's never the same thing. So the demonic realm, los santero, la, la gente que hace brujería and all that other stuff, the voodoo, that's why they offer them things. If you look those things up, they have a cigar, they have a shot glass, they have a corona. I've seen people with arrobicho uh, carne plates that, that, they, that they offer to the spiritual realm. So my thing with, with the body of Christ that I'm sure if it frustrates me, it should frustrate the Lord as well. Darkness believes in the power of darkness. If you take a chair and you whip it across the room, if a witch takes a chair and whips it across the room, we're like, oh, wow. But you tell somebody that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins, and whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And we're like, I don't really know if that's true. So darkness believes in darkness and the devil and his, and his spiritual powers, but us, the children of light, we question everything. Because we need knowledge and understanding. The next image. Here's a real life image of somebody who practices syncretism. You can see he's in the pose of yoga. Right? You can see that this religion is different. When the apostles say that they suffered for Christ, this is not what that is. This is a self-mutilation. The reason why the apostles suffer for Christ is because they don't want, they, the spiritual realm, doesn't want the exaltation of Christ to be presented because the exaltation of Christ is not is better than this. So Islam, Buddhist, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, which that's a word that I found this weekend. Zoroastrian is founded by a man named Zoroaster who says that, uh, that he believes that he's the creator of the world. Everybody's a creator. But there cannot be so many creators for creation. There's only one source. That's what this letter is written to. All of these um, Gnosticism, mysticism, syncretism, all of these beliefs, Islam, Buddhism, all of those beliefs, they deny Christ as God. That's the whole purpose. The whole purpose is for the spiritual realm to confuse you on what you really are. Because if I can confuse you, then I can break you. That's the way the spiritual realm operates. So the, the Colossian church was experiencing the same problems as the other early churches had encountered. The way to fight any false doctrine is to immediately point to Christ. When you teach anything and it points to the exaltation of Christ, to the truth of Christ, you'll always be able to break all false doctrines. Jesus always is the focal point of Paul's preaching, preachings and his messages since the beginning of his ministry. The Holy Spirit reiterates the supremacy of Christ through the teachings of the Apostle Paul because Christ is divine, making the reason for his death and reconciliation to believers, uh, excuse me, making his death and the reconciliation of believers to our creator. Even today, new cults 
claim to be Christian, yet they deny the deity of Christ. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses. They say that Jesus existed, but that he's not God. Islam say that Jesus existed, but he's not God. So it's not, see, my thing that helped me early in my walk is that I thought Jesus was fake and I had to force myself to believe. So what I did was I had a blind faith and I said, yo, I'm just going to believe everything that this word says. But when I started studying other religions and I said, wait a minute, Islam says that Jesus was real too? Then I said, wait a minute. So then if they believe that he's real and the Holy Bible says that he's real, then what's the issue? Well, the issue is, is he was real, but he's not God. I said, that's the lie. That's the lie. The lie is, is that Jesus is not God. But today and in the beginning of this series, scripture is going to prove to you the deity of Christ. Scripture is going to prove to you that Christ is God in the flesh. Amen. So many today view Jesus as no more than a great teacher. Paul's patient correction of the Colossian believers should remind us that we must keep Jesus Christ as the center of everything that we do. This epistle was written after Paul's third missionary journey while imprisoned in Rome. Colossae was a significant strategic city, but it dwindled over time and it was only a shadow of what it was at one point. Let me tell you the difference between the book of Ephesus and the book of Colossians. The book of Ephesus is what we're studying on Wednesday now. The mystery, because um, this book, this epistle of, to the church of Colossae says, that, uh, says the word mystery. But the difference is, is that in Ephesians, the mystery was, was the Jew and the Gentile and how were they going to be brought back to Christ. Does that make sense? In the church of Ephesus, the word mystery is mentioned, but it was Jesus uniting two groups the Jews and the Gentiles. There was no issue in Ephesus. Now, in the church of Colossae, the mystery is, is how Christ lives in you. Once you realize that you carry the kingdom of God and its fullness inside of you, the game changes. Everything changes in your life. When you realize that, that that's what this is about. Like this is the holy word of God. This is God's word way before you and way after you. This church of Colossae and everything that it says is going to be there. Now with different variations, you see that some words are changed, but the message is still the same. Colossians has a more assertive tone because it didn't confront any false teachings. These epistles present mature understanding of Christ, of who Christ is and what his life and death mean for the believer. So now we get into the text. I read this in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you open the eyes of your people, Lord. Lord, I pray that you chip away at the rock on their heart, Lord, of the stone of their heart. Lord, enter their mind, enter their heart, Lord. Break their understanding from anything that's false, any Gnosticism, Lord, anything that they learn from their parents, anything that they learn from religion, Lord, any false idols, Lord, that they have in their heart, any carved images, Lord, that they may worship, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you open their mind. Only you can do that, Lord. Only you can do that. It cannot be done by man, but you can do that. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, that's Paul's writing style, is to give an introduction of, of who he is and who called him. That's why it says Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God, excuse me, 
as you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, as you also learned from Epaphras, who's the one that started the church, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Remember, we increase in the knowledge of God and we discern one another. You don't grow in knowledge of one another and discern God. We have knowledge of God, we discern one another. Two completely different things. In order for you to discern what's happening at this level, you have to know God. The more you know God, the more you can operate in the spiritual realm on earth. The more your relationship with God, if you have issues with relationships, it's most likely because you have an issue with this relationship. The stronger that your vertical relationship is, the easier your horizontal relationships will be. Does that make sense? Assess your life, look at where you are, and say to yourself, I have a lot of issues with this person and this person in my house and this person, my neighbor and all this stuff. How is my relationship with God? Because the closer you get to God, by default, the love of Christ comes out of you. Amen? Verse 11. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Verse 15, this is a colossal claim by God. This right here breaks every religion that I've ever heard of. Because they'll tell you that Christ existed, but they won't tell you that Christ is God. What, what can you do when the word of God says he is the image of the invisible God? He is the image of the invisible God. That means Christ is the embodiment of our heavenly father. He is the image of the invisible God and then the firstborn over all creation. This is where people like to get cute with the word of God. Because when it says the firstborn over all creation, it does not mean like um, I have a dog that God created and then God created Jesus at, at the same level. No. What this means here is that it's firstborn means that it is a reference to rank and privilege than to order and birth because Christ is God. So he's supreme in rank over all creation. Now, what happens is when you take part B of verse 15 and you make your own religion out of that and it contradicts other parts of the Bible because the Holy Spirit is not going to say that Christ is the firstborn, meaning he's just God's first creation and then say in other places that he's God. Does that make sense? Amen. No other theology, none. I've studied them enough, and I'm telling you to study them yourself, but for today, uh, trust me momentarily. No other theology makes the claim to remove sin. None. None. None of them. Buddhists, they say, you know, you, 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 you do the, the repetitive prayer. The Bible says don't repeat prayer like the heathens do. The, 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 hmm. You get into some spirituality that you open the door for a demonic presence in your life because anything that you do that's spiritual, that's outside of the order of God, gives the devil access into your life. The Muslims say if you, if you sin against somebody, you do a thousand nice things for them. That's a works-based doctrine. So what if you do a thousand nice things for somebody and I don't think there are a thousand nice things? You got to do another thousand nice things? You see the issue with that, with no standard? 
No other theology makes the claim for remission of sin. And here's another truth. No other theology has any blood in it. None. Muhammad, uh, uh, Allah, none of them make the claim to have shed blood for your sins. None of them. Buddha, Confucius, Selassie, I, the Dalai Lama, none of them. None of them. The zodiac signs, nothing, nothing has shed blood for you. Only Christ. That's the claim. That's the only thing that you have got to learn. You got to follow the blood. You got to follow the blood. That's why in the demonic realm, I rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. He's going to be completely exposed today that's why you see in the satanic realm what do they use they cut chickens heads off they 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 they, they kidnap children they sacrifice them to get the blood because there's power in the blood there's life in the blood. Now, it's demonic, but it still works for what they want. The reason why the devil does that, and, and men and women, they get kidnapped, and they get killed, and they get slaughtered. The Mayans and the Aztecs at the temple, when they would sacrifice 20,000 people a year, would be sacrificed to some god. Because the devil, his job is to confuse you. His job is to make you say, that's not real, but this is real. So you have to follow the blood. Follow the blood. No other religion makes that claim. Do your research. No other claim says that they have any blood for atonement. You need a sacrifice for the sin in your life. You need a sacrifice every time you sin. There has to be a blood sacrifice for that sin. Paul makes five claims in this epistle that Christ qualified us to share in his inheritance, that Christ delivered us from Satan's dominion of darkness, that he brought us into his eternal kingdom as children. Number four, he redeemed us and bought our freedom from sin and judgment, and he forgave our sins. Verse 15, again, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So now we go to John 1, verses 1 through 4. So I showed you that Paul says that he's God. Now I'm going to take you to another part of the Bible that says that he's God. In the beginning was the word. When you see a capital, that is a sign of divinity. So in the beginning was the word. Jesus is called the word of God. So in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. That is a colossal statement confirming what the Apostle Paul is saying. This is the Apostle John. Remember, the Holy Spirit then spoke through everybody. That's why there can be no confusion. Does that make sense? Right? Do we agree that God is not the author of confusion? Amen. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14, John continues on, and he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten father, full of grace and truth. We see now two apostles stating the deity of Christ. So now when we go back, we go to Psalm 89, 23. Whatever is in the law and the prophets, you're going to find it in the Greek text. Whatever is in the Greek text, to, to ensure that you're reading it correctly, you have to verify it through the law and the prophets. Does that make sense? So if somebody tells you that the Old Testament, we can throw it out, what do you have to verify what you're reading? No, no, let's, 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 let's. If, if, if you need this to understand this, and I tell you, you got to throw that away. I can confuse you. Because the Jehovah's Witness doctrine cannot be proven using the law and the prophets. 
That's why when you speak to them and they're in the street, they just keep quoting all of these silly fortune cookie verses over here, pa ponerte a lo loco, to, to, to twist you around. When you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So Paul quotes Psalm 89, verse 23, when he says, and I will, um, I, I wrote down the wrong verse. That's okay. Um, but it says, the verse, um, that's not, it's not Psalm 89, 23, but it says, I will make him, it's actually 27, 89, 27, if you can get it up. I also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings on earth. So when you see the apostle Paul saying that Jesus Christ is the firstborn, he has the, the book of Psalms to verify what it is that he's saying. So we see that Christ is the one who created all things, making this idea in direct contradiction to the false teaching called Gnosticism. Gnostics believe in various angelic beings as the creators of the earth and that Christ was just one of the many angels. All right. Let's go back to verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, meaning Christ. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This, this, this is the meat of chapter 1. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that's us, that in all things he may have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, all the fullness of Christ. Brother John Paul, come up here for a second, please. You, you have to understand this claim that the Lord is making. And you have to look at this from your life. Thank you, man of God. This is the beginning of creation. This is Adam and this is the father. The, I'm going to illustrate to you what Colossians 1 is saying. This was how humanity started. Because of sin... The relationship, you're going to stand there for a moment. The relationship severed because of sin. Does that make sense? This is from the beginning of time. This is what the apostle Paul is saying. So our relationship with God now is like this, where we have been, because he is holy. You understand? The father is holy. The presence of God is holy. So nothing unclean. I'm now impure. I cannot be in his presence. So because of humanity, that's why the Bible says that because of Adam, we've all been casted out. So we, there is a gap that is in between me and the Father. Gnosticism, mysticism, and syncretism say that this doesn't matter. That this space here, that it's not true. That you can get to this God, the creator, any way that you want. Brother Michael. But now, we have Jesus. Here's what's happening here. Paul wrote this letter to break them from this understanding that they could do whatever it is that they wanted to get to the Father. But because the Father loves us so much, he says, I want to be with my creation. I want to be with them, but I can't be with them because they are unholy. Now, there's a lot of theological points here that I'm not going to be able to mention because we don't have time. So show me grace and let's go to the greater picture of salvation. So the father now, he was married to Adam. He cannot be married to Adam. He was married to Israel. He cannot be married 
to Israel anymore. So the father is looking upon and saying, how can I get them to come back to me and be holy again in my presence? So Jesus is not a different God, because we just read where John says that he was in the beginning, he was God. We just read that he's the visible image of the invisible God. So what the father did is he extended himself in human form. He made himself in human form. That's why Jesus, Jesus has to be, remember this is a teaching church. I'm teaching you what the message is of salvation of the church of Colossae. That's why the Bible says it's Jesus the baby and Christ the anointed. That's why he's one, scripture says that Jesus Christ is 100% human and 100% God. If Jesus Christ is not 100% human and 100% God, there is no salvation. It's God that sacrificed God that was raised by God. That has to be the equation or there's no salvation. That's the significance of blood, okay? Give me one second. So God, the Father, says, I want to be with my people, but I need to cleanse them first. I need a remission of sin before they can come back. What Gnosticism is, Sister Glennis, please. Here's what's happening in the church of Colossae. Stand right here in front of Mike. What the church of Colossae says, I don't have to go through the son, Jesus Christ. I can go through a goddess to get to the father. I can go through, I can bring this idol, I can worship this idol, and that will get me into the presence of God. But here's the thing, the truth doesn't change. You understand? It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you say. That's the truth. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. It doesn't matter what you say. That's the beauty about God is that he is God all by himself. God, the whole truth is here. Okay, Sister Jennifer. Please stand right here. So then you say... Well, let me do syncretism or uh, mysticism. I'm going to have multiple gods now. And they will help me get there. But the Father has already established a system for you to come back to him. You cannot change what God established. You can't. You cannot change it. This is false teaching. This is the false teaching in the church of Colossae. Where God the Son is here, and we have created different paths thinking that that's going to get us to the Father. Does that make sense? Thank you, my sisters. Can somebody praise God for a moment? Let's go back to the text. He, verse 15, meaning Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father, for it pleased the Father, that in him the fullness, the fullness, God gave everything as an extension of himself and buried it inside of the Son Jesus Christ for a sacrifice. And, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, 
by him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. Verse 21, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind, you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled himself to you. So we see Christ, who's no longer on the cross. We see Christ risen, right? We see Christ risen. History shows that they saw Jesus, that uh, people recorded even outside of the word of God that they saw Jesus. They saw him in the glorified body. He's the first one to have a glorified body. So now, Brother John Paul, right here, please. Now... My relationship with the Father is different now. Because now my relationship with the Father is through who? It's through who? So you never pray to God like this. Because if you pray to God like this, he's going to see that you bypass the cross. And ain't nobody going to bypass the cross. Ain't nobody. Ain't nobody. That's why the Lord said, that's why the Lord spoke to the church. Don't get cute because the message is illustrated. Don't get cute that the message looks cool. You know the truth now. You're on the hook now. God go, yup, KVCC, they know. Boom, who's next? So when there's a new person that comes, everybody that comes and you hear this, you can never say, I'm going to look at everybody. You can never say to God that you didn't know the truth. Now, you didn't accept it. That's different. But you can never say, I didn't know I needed to repent for my sins. All right? So now we go back and we say, Father, in the name of Jesus. And then the Father looks and he says, I hear, my, I hear the blood of my son speaking to me. I hear the blood of my son. So I'm going to bless you for my name's sake, says scripture. So when you ask God for something and you want it for selfish reasons you don't get it but if you say lord bless me with a church that's financially rich so we can buy bible so they can learn about jesus the father says let it be so because of christ praise god hold on guys all right verse uh, timothy 120 uh, 1 timothy so now we see another epistle of paul that he writes, and we're going to study this too. For there is one God and one mediator between who? God. Between who? God. Okay, we're going to say that again, but you're going to say God, and then you're going to say your name. There's one mediator between who? God. Between who? God. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. This is why we worship Jesus Christ. Now, put your back to him. So now, when the apostle Paul says, okay, and I cover all of us in the name of Jesus. When the apostle Paul says that we bow down to Christ, you see that you're not breaking the commandment. If, if Paul tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us through Paul to bow down to Jesus, if Jesus is not God, the Bible would be making us break the first commandment. The Bible would be setting us up to bow down to something that's not God. So he has to be God. He has to be God. Jesus has to be God or we would be bowing down to uh, uh, job, uh, number five from Chick-fil-A. You understand? The simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel. Now, if you don't want to believe this, that's called free will. You're free to choose, but you're not free to decide the consequences. You're not free to decide the consequences. You can do whatever you want. You can say that's not true because my uncle was a pastor for 20 years and he said this, 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 and that. It doesn't matter. So when we look at God and we're, worship, we're praising the name of Jesus, this is what we're doing. But guess who's inside of us? Somebody say it with, with courage. The Holy Spirit. So now the same God, because the Bible says that Christ 
return back to the Father. And Jesus said, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send you the spirit that comes from him. So that spirit, now this is what the letter of Colossae is talking about. The Holy Spirit is in the room. That, that letter of Colossae is telling them that this system is now in you. You don't need to mutilate your body and suffer. You don't need to have false worship. You don't need a, 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 a crystal. These people, you're laughing, right? Because, not, not that you're laughing, but you know what I'm saying. People worship rocks, man. I know people that worship rocks. I know them. I went to school with them. And they post pictures of crystals. That, oh, I said, look at the little red uh, chakra or whatever. People believe that. So what you believe, I rather believe this. I rather believe that God so loved me that he established a system so that I can be saved. I rather believe this. I rather believe this than to believe syncretism and starve myself and mutilate myself. I rather believe this. I rather believe this than the Islamic faith that says that I can get to the Father. That ain't Muhammad. That is not Muhammad. That is not Confucius. That's not Selassie, who is considered a god in Jamaica. That's not who that is. Only Christ shed blood so that I can be cleansed and be with the Father. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brothers. This is why Scripture should be exciting to you, just being read. So here's the thing, right? So people are like, oh, you know, I don't really like religion. Well, if you don't like religion, then you have to do order. Well, I don't really like order either. Then you just like whatever you like. You're on your own. If you, that's the significance of the commandments of God. God says, you don't have to do it, but you're not going to be with me if you're not going to do what I say. So this is why the simplicity of scripture, that should make you run around and jump and scream hallelujah. That's why we worship Jesus. That's why we're like, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble because the devil's job is to make you not worship that. That system is his, his whole thing from when you're born to when you die. The entire time the devil is trying to blind you from that. The whole time. He ain't trying to get you a college degree. He ain't trying to give you a flat tire. The devil didn't turn on your check engine light. He didn't make your rent go up. No. He's just trying to blind you from that. So that's why we have to understand the simplicity of Scripture. For it pleased the Father, verse 20, that in him the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your own mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. Whatever Jesus went through, you have to go through. So now, it's your turn. Pick up your cross. It's so, it's so simple. It's so simple, but we don't want to make it simple because we don't, we don't want, we don't want the truth. We don't want the truth. If you want to be like Jesus, then you got to do what he did and you got to go through the cross, man. You got to carry this thing to where you own it. And the people say, well, why, why would I want to do that? Because if you don't carry the wrath of God on the cross now, you're going to carry it later on. You're going to carry a, a burden in hell. That's the whole job of false teaching is to confuse you from this. And it's not self-mutilation. 
You know, carrying the cross is denying what you want for him. So we think that this means a life of depravity. No, this doesn't mean that. This just means that he comes first because he, Jesus reconciled us back to God. He reconciled us back to God. Does that make sense? Father, only you can open their eyes. Verse 23, and if indeed you continue, if indeed you continue in the faith, thank you. If indeed you continue in continue in the faith and grounded and steadfast and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I Paul became a minister verse 24 I now rejoice in my sufferings for you that's why when you're carrying around a cross how can you have a bad day Paul is writing this letter from from jail He's sitting in a jail with the cross on him and he says, I don't care because the mystery of God has been revealed to me. I'm saved. Have you ever asked yourself, what are you saved from? You think that you're saved from the devil. You're saved from the wrath of God. He is judge. God is judge. He's going to judge your sin. He's going to use the commandments that we were told to whip them out the back door. God is a judge. Have you ever been in a courtroom? The tension in a courtroom. All rise. What? If you don't stand up for the judge, the court officer comes and he says, get up. Stand up. That's the honor for a man. Imagine God. So God, he's going to look at you and he's going to hold his law up and he's going to say, ba, 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 ba. Or he's going to look at you through the son, Jesus Christ, and he's going to say, he paid all this. You're free to go. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's that simple. The gospel is that simple. The truth of God is that simple. If that's the truth, say amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Praise God. Let's finish up. The mystery, uh, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages. You see, in the Old Testament, they didn't know how the whole thing was going to play out because Jesus hadn't come yet. But now has been revealed to his saints, verse 27, to them, God will to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Where does it say that in scripture? When somebody asks you, where does it say that, that Christ lives in you? It says it in Colossians 1.27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery. Among the Gentiles, which is in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach. I love that. Those three words in verse 28. Him we preach. Him. That's what we need to preach. That's the message that the church has lost. Because when you preach about Mercedes Benzes and all of these other things, and God is going to, God is going to, God ain't going to bless you. He's going to break you. He is going to break you. Unless you have Jesus Christ in your life. So when we're like, oh, you know, I, 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 see, I, I see a house coming to you. I see cars coming to you. Yo, I see your business about to explode. Run. Run. That's heresy. That's equivalent to syncretism. Anything that takes your eyes off of the glory of God, that's syncretism. That's a lie from the pits of hell. You want to be prosperous? Die to self. You want to be prosperous? Submit to God. You want to be prosperous? Die to your needs and God will lift you up. The Bible says, he who, come on, the Bible says, he who exalts himself, he who exalts himself, he will be brought down low. And he, and
And he who is brought down low, he will exalt. That's the difference. That's the difference. You end up becoming alive in Christ. Your life is better. What this, what this chapter is saying is that we were dead without Christ. And we come alive. How can you possibly go through depression when you know that you're risen from the grave? How can you possibly have anxiety from looking ahead when you already know what already happens ahead? How can you possibly be upset over a divorce or that they left or that you got sick or this when you already know where you're going? How? This man wrote this letter in jail telling us to be happy. If I wrote you a letter from jail, that's not, I wouldn't be telling you to rejoice. I'd be like, yo, you talk to my lawyer? Have you, people from the hood, oh, let, me, let me keep going. Uh, verse 28, let us all stand to our feet as we close the message. Him we preach. Look at this, verse 28. Him we preach. Him we preach. That's KBCC right here. Him we preach. Him we preach him. We preach Christ, crucified, risen, the only God, Savior, the, the beloved, the Alpha, the Omega. Him, him we preach. Him, him, him we preach. Why? Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. See? We may present every man perfect in Christ. Perfect in Christ. Not that you have your own perfection. The only thing that you can perfectly do is die. That you can do. Your, to your desires, to your goals, to your dreams, to your flesh. On Friday, the message was about the tongue. You know how many text messages I got? Telling me, yo, pastor, that message cut me. And I said, to God be the glory. All I did was read the chapter. And the Holy Spirit was like... Because this word is applicable. This is a living word. This is a true word. Stop looking at this with doubt. Anything, any relationship that you have with doubt, it will never grow. I'll never grow with Sister Arlen if I'm like, man, does she, is she, is, you know, is, 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 does she really, does she think? No, but when I'm like, yo, that's my sister. We've known each other since way back. She, blah, blah, blah. We'll grow in understanding. We'll grow in understanding. Verse 29, this it, to this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. If you're in this place, if you are in this room and you are separated from God, and you, that's why you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because God forgives you unto him. If you've never repent, you have to repent of your sins to receive this. If you have never asked Jesus to forgive you for sin, if you've never said that prayer, come out of your seat.